Chris Mikowski from Emerging Civil War, and I am on the phone with Robert Lee Hodge. Uh, Rob, rather legendary among the uh, Civil War community, and particularly for his reenacting, uh, in large part because of his relationship with uh, the late Tony Horwitz. And I asked Rob if he'd uh, spend a few minutes just to share some of his memories of Tony and talk about his reactions. Um, how did you feel about the news that uh, that you heard today? Oh, well, it was shocking. Um at first, I thought it was some sort of sick joke or something. Um, I, I was floored by it. I uh, had just communicated with him last week. He was in Nashville for a, a book tour, but uh, his handlers uh, kept him on a tight leash, and uh, I had wanted them to come over, and that was the plan for him to come over. We were going to sit around the bonfire and just reminisce and, uh, and uh, show him my man cave which ironically is in an attic and uh, it has a Confederate theme to it and he said he wanted to see it but uh, he that he, he just couldn't make it uh, because of schedule and he wanted me to come over to where he was talking on the other side of town but uh, based on the distance and the time of day um, Nash, it would be very hard to do it and so I said well why don't why don't we just get together, uh, you know, the next time you're in town, which would be in October. And so that was the plan. And so, you know, now I regret not trying to fight through all the traffic to get to, to see him. Now, I guess Tony first came into your life because you were literally in his front yard once upon a time. Can you uh, recount that meeting for us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I was a location coordinator and uh, basically reenactor wrangler for the show Civil War Journal for many of the episodes. And uh, we were doing an episode on Fredericksburg, on the Battle of Fredericksburg. And um, we couldn't film in downtown Fredericksburg because, you know, it's a functioning community. You couldn't block streets off and things like that. So we filmed in Waterford, Virginia, which has uh, some similar architecture and Waterford is kind of like uh, in a lot of ways like Brigadoon um, it seems to be asleep a lot and um, it, it had this essence or texture of history and uh, so we decided to film there and um, just the way he wrote, wrote about it in the Attic we're filming and, and you know we're shooting guns off in the town behind uh, a stone wall uh, replicating the stone wall at Marie's Heights in Fredericksburg and, uh, and and Tony was disturbed. He heard the gunfire and came out of his uh, house in a sleepy town, or at least once sleepy town of Waterford, and uh, we struck up a kinship. He brought out coffee and we just started talking and one thing led to another and, and uh, uh, I guess then the first thing was he wrote about uh, uh, wrote about reenacting, wrote about me, wrote about the guys I hung out with in reenacting um, in the Wall Street Journal in June of 1994. So I met him in February of 94. And then the Wall Street Journal article comes out in June of 94. Um, and right around this time, he wins the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, so he's hanging out with me and my reenacting buddies in the daytime, and in the, at night he's hanging out with Al Gore at the White House. So he was, uh, you know, quite a celebrity. And um, and because he won the uh, Pulitzer Prize and getting all these accolades, he, he basically wanted to turn the Wall Street Journal article that he had written about reenacting and, and me into a book. And uh, so that's what, uh, that's what happened with Confederates in the Attic. And um, and then uh, comes out ninety ninety eight becomes a bestseller. Yeah. yeah. What sort of impact did that book have on on you and your Civil War experience? Uh, uh, well, I, I guess the first thing was this: is uh, um, I was doing a preservation fundraiser for the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust in May of 1998 uh, on the anniversary of Stonewall Jackson's flight march. Uh, it took place on a Saturday in uh, May 2nd, 1863. It takes place on a Saturday in 1998. 
uh, so we do this uh, fundraising. Well, the night before, uh, and I'm getting ready for this crazy event I'm putting on, and um, I'm watching uh, the Late Late Show, then hosted by Tom Snyder, when it was much more of a talk show as opposed to comedic entertainment as it is now. And, um, and Tony was on there and um, talking about promoting the Confederates in the Attic book. And uh, Tom Snyder said, uh, tell me about this Robert Lee Hodge. He sounds like a fascinating character. And here I, I'm watching the TV and I'm like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. And, uh, and Tony said, he's my mentor, which I, I never felt that that's really the way he felt about me, but I'll take the credit for that. <laughs> I don't think that was accurate. But um, that was really kind of the first impact where I'm like, wow, this is, this is uh, going to be bigger than I anticipated. And, uh, you know, I would get calls from the BBC and, uh, and you know, the Baltimore Sun and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and the Comedy Channel, which they turned down. <laughs> um, but... It became something that I, I wasn't prepared for. Uh, I didn't have any kind of agent or or anything like that. Um, and I, I really, in a lot of ways, was kind of stuck my head in the ground like an ostrich because it was kind of overwhelming for a while. And I couldn't keep up with the correspondence of people writing me, getting a hold of me, um, you know, from little kids that wanted my autograph to marriage proposals. So <laughs> it uh, it became quite the thing. And, and at one point, Demi Moore and uh, Bill Paxton uh, were fighting over movie rights to Confederate thematic. So I, I was really, you know, kind of overwhelmed by it all. And um, it was enjoyable, but I, I didn't feel I deserved the credit I got uh, just because there were so many other reenactors and preservationists that I looked up to um, that really inspired me. Uh, so, you know, I just felt very fortunate, but I also felt awkward about the attention. Yeah. What sort of um, what sort of impact do you think the book had on the Civil War community on the whole? Well, I would say that if if the test of time, standing the test of time, is an indication of quality, um, I would say that Confederates in the Attic is a grand slam. Um, now, being on the inside of it, I, I you know I can be very critical of it at times, but um, looking at how academia uh, uses it still. To this day, you know, my nieces that went to school, uh, you know, were reading Confederates in the Attic, you know, five years ago. And, uh, you know, they were, they would brag to people that their uncle was the guy on the cover. <laughs> I don't know if it's something to brag about or not. But, but uh, it, it, I, I think that um, when I spoke at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill years ago, um, you know, when you see the academic uh, community embracing the book, uh, you know, that, that was kind of a, a flag for me or a green light for me to, to say, wow, this is, you know, on that level, not just on an entertainment level, but on a cerebral, um, uh, you know, dissecting history level, um, I realized it was big. And, and the fact that it's used still so much. I guess is the uh, is maybe the endorsement uh, of of the quality, and uh, you know a lot of times uh, you know people speak of Tony's quality of writing, his his rhythmic ability to write and, and and have a flow where you can glide through a book, and I'd have to agree with that. I think that his uh, ability, you know, it's sort of, sort of weird to say was past him, but. Uh, was so uh, smooth and so rhythmic and made it easier to, to me, digest. 
Yeah, I think that uh, one of his great talents as a, as a reporter was his ability to immerse himself in a story and then just listen to people tell their own stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he, uh, I, thought, I thought that there was a very compassionate side to him. He had a compassionate side that was genuine. Um, I also think that, you know, when he got his advance to write Confederates in the Attic, I don't necessarily feel it was a, 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 a journey of discovery like it was purported to be, because I don't think that you're going to get a $200,000 advance on a book unless your editors and, your, and the book company agree kind of to, uh, you know, what, what, the, uh, what the content's going to be. So I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like it was any kind of... Um, uh, quest as much as uh, you know he purported it to be mm-hmm. um, I, I, I kind of think to some degree that there was already kind of an idea of what was to some degree what 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 he wanted to write but um, I, I do feel that there was a sincere amount of compassion for really just about everybody in the book. Um, and that includes maybe to a lesser extent, but to some degree with this Wall Street Journal article. Um, but I was in the middle of a lot of that stuff, and a lot of reenactors did not like the book. Even guys that are commenting today on how, how impactful the book was. I remember when the book came out, I was ostracized by a lot of reenactors. And there was a lot of reenactors that did not like Tony um, for the way that he wrote. Um, about reenacting, and um, and that was always uncomfortable uh, for me um, because this is my uh, life lifelong quest uh, for whatever reason, and you know, for him to write about it and then move on, he wasn't always there for the hits that I that I took, um, but I remember one time in particular, he really did stand up for me. Um, this was before Confederates in the Attic, before he even started really writing it, but it was after the Wall Street Journal article. And um, in the Civil War News magazine at that time, in 1994, there was basically some really kind of hateful letters that were written about Tony, and, and more so me, because I was kind of collaborating with the enemy, so to speak, in, in some of the reenactors' minds. And um, and I was getting beat up on pretty hard and uh, taking the lumps, and, and I didn't feel I, I deserved them. Um, but Tony wrote a really nice article to Civil War News um, that was very, very thoughtful, and I, I'm going to have to look for that. I, I have a piling system, and I know that I still have that article somewhere, and uh, I want to dig that up and find that again. Um, it's kind of funny to, to recall how controversial the book was in some circles at the time because it's become so iconic since then. Right, right. Well, it's, it's weird because a lot of reenactors um, that got into reenacting after Confederates in the Attic got into that into reenacting because of the book. Whereas, like I said, you know, a lot of reenactors, many in the Southern Guard, the, the hardcore reenactment group that I belonged to at the time, a lot of them were really upset and were really upset with me. Um, and when I first met Tony, uh, talking to him on the phone and so forth after our initial meeting, he said he wanted to join a reenactment unit. And I thought to myself, how cool would it be to have uh, a guy of his pedigree uh, that had an empathy with with Civil War history to to be in our group. Gosh, wouldn't that be neat for us to have a uh, writer from the Wall Street Journal, Pulitzer Prize winning author? Well, it was kind of a half truth because he wanted to join a reenactment group so he could write about it, and and I didn't quite get the full picture until over a period of time and so I, I really I didn't never never felt like he was fully forthright in that regard um, uh, but regardless of that I think that one of the helpful things that he did with reenacting is is 
have this platform to be able to talk about the differences in reenacting or the nuances of reenacting, of the more cerebral types, perhaps zany at times, maybe too zany or sensational. Um, but uh, the, the people that were getting into the esoteric, getting into the detail, going to the National Archives and going to the Library of Congress and going to various repositories, going to the old Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond um, to look at original items to get much closer to the past through uh, the written record and also through the items. Um, and for whatever reason, that visual history draw that so many reenactors have, um, for him to illustrate the, the, the hyper detail that some of the, quote, hardcore, unquote, reenactors would get into, uh, a lot of reenactors have said that that was a big plus. Um, you know, despite maybe some of the warts or the thorns with the writing. Um, and, of course, you know, n none of us that do the reenacting thing are going to, are, are, you know, it's, a, it's our own perspective. It's relative, you know. And, and, you know, the way I see myself and the way Tony saw me and the way others see me, you know, that, that's all over the place. Sure. So. But uh, ultimately, I think uh, there was some uh, genuine compassion, um, you know, and, and like I said, it doesn't come with hiccups, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful to have met the guy, and, you know, I'm still kind of numb, you know, with the idea, you know. I mean, I just talked to him a few days ago, and I'm looking at an email, you know, uh, just a moment ago from him, just the other day, and... Uh, and of course, it has uh, insults in it, trading barbs back and forth. We always did that. <laughs> and uh, kind of like with Ed Bars, you know, it's a term of endearment if you're getting insults from Ed Bars. Yeah. <laughs> and I must be at the top of the list because, boy, does he insult me a lot. Uh, as well, um, nothing like busting each other's chops, right? Busting each other's chops all the time. And, and, and you know, if, he's not, if, if he wasn't busting your chops, then, um, you know, maybe. Maybe didn't care for you. <laughs> right, right. right. So, I don't know. So, so uh, any uh, any final observations? Final observations. You know, I, I guess honestly, I think I'm a very lucky person, um, and it's it was an avalanche of I don't know if it was luck or what, but it was an avalanche of amazing timing um, in the '90s. Um, you know, between Horowitz and Ed Bars and Brian Pohanka. I mean, I had so much, so much great stuff coming my way. It was just unbelievable. Um, and, you know, I, I just feel it's all kind of a, a surreal thing. I mean, it, it sometimes I pinch myself and think about, you know, how lucky I am to have met all the great people that I've met, and certainly Tony Horowitz was one of them. Right. We've been talking with Robert Lee Hodge, the poster boy on the cover of Confederates in the Attic and a friend of Tony Horwitz, sharing his thoughts on the author who passed away yesterday. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chris.